Booyah, and it's time for the Game Sports Show. This is the Game Sports Show podcast. I am your host, David McCaig Jr. This is episode six of the Game Sports Show podcast, and it's powered by the Game Entertainment and Media, the TGM Network YouTube channel. And the TGM Network YouTube channel is maybe where you're tuned into the show right now, the video version of the Game Sports Show podcast. Make sure you hit like, follow, and subscribe on the Game Entertainment and Media, the TGM Network YouTube channel, and its content to make sure you get the notifications when there is an upload. You may be also tuned into the Game Sports Show on one of the many audio platforms that we are on. Either way, make sure you hit like, follow, and subscribe to make sure you keep up to date with the Twin Sioux's only local, regional, and national sports show, the Game Sports Show. Now, without further ado, you mentioned who I am. You mentioned what the show is powered by. Let's talk about the sponsors of the Game Sports Show podcast. We got Flawless Roofing Sure Steel Incorporated. Flawless Roofing Sure Steel Incorporated is located in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, and in Thunder Bay. Okay, it's got over 30 years of experience. You can see right behind me there in the calendar that uh, Flawless Roofing is definitely well displayed in the T-Gem studios. But why not have it displayed on your house or on your commercial rooftop, your residential, whatever it may be. Protect your investment and start from the top. All right. When, When the weather's bad, when it's raining, you know, you don't want no leakage in your house. You don't want any damage in your house. It all starts with protecting your investment from the top. And that's with Flawless Roofing, Sure Seal Incorporated. If you have any interest in reaching out to Flawless Roofing, make sure you reach out to yours truly or check them out at flawlessroofing.ca. You can get all the details on there. And you'd be crazy not to reach out to Flawless Roofing to protect that investment of yours. This is also brought to you by the Sport Displays. The Sport Displays Jersey Mount product look Throughout the entirety of the T-Gem office, it's mostly in front of me and to the side of me. On this side, you can't see it on the camera, and those of you on audio have no idea what I'm talking about. But right behind me, there is no Jersey Mount product, but around me and in front of me on the in the T-Gem studios, there is the Jersey Mount product, and the Sport Displays Jersey Mount product is absolutely fantastic. You can hang up your jersey, your jersey shirt, your just your T-shirt if you want, your dress shirt. Whatever you want to display in your office, your garage, maybe you want to put it in your man cave, maybe you want to put it in your bedroom, maybe you want to put it in your bathroom because you're one of those individuals where when you want to go to the bathroom, you want to look at your jerseys. I I don't know. Whatever whatever floats your boat. Either way, the jersey mount is a fantastic product. It's very simple to install. You just either put the double-sided tape on the back or you can screw it to the wall. It's interchangeable so you're not stuck with having one jersey up there all the time. You can take it off and put rotate through jerseys. In my office, i got a Mari Turkle jersey, Felix Poffin jersey, John Tavares jersey. I've got a Vlad Guerrero jersey going on. i got a Pittsburgh Steelers jersey going on. Look, there is lots of jersey options that you can put up on the wall. If you hang them all up at once, you may as well do them with all Jersey Mount products, or if you only have a limited amount of jerseys you want to put up because of space, well, you may as well have the ability to interchange it. So why not use the Sport Displays Jersey Mount product? They also have the Rays Fundraising, R-A-Z-D. You can check out R-A-Z-D Fundraising on YouTube. It's an initiative where you can be involved in selling and being a part of raising money for your organization for selling the Jersey Mount product. Now, talk about the sponsors on the show. I want to give a shout out to those who are involved really in the Game Sports Show podcast and Game Sports Show family to the exception of our wonderful analysts. I want to give a shout out to Mike Tassoni and Alex Flood. Mike Tassoni is the producer of the Game Sports Show podcast. Yours truly is the one who is producing and editing this particular episode, but Mike Tassoni is involved. And Alex Flood, he is the one that you see upload uh, and be a part of the video editing for the special edition uploads. And our most recent one with Alex Bolduke, former Vancouver Canuck, fantastic episode. And I must give credit to those beautiful thumbnails that you see yes that is my fiance hannah doing that work with the thumbnails so credit to her also just fantastic and just a random promotion here that has nothing to do with the show yours truly has a stag and doe coming up on may the 26th if you're in the susan Marie region and you want to come to have a good time there's limited tickets available some great prizes and it goes to a great cause and that great cause is for my upcoming wedding this year so if you want to come out to the event you can come and get tickets at the door or reach out to yours truly to get tickets if you're not from susan Marie and you're a fan of the show and you want to be a part of maybe having uh, your ticket involved in the door prize, a $500 door prize for my stag and doe uh, with myself, my fiance, Hannah, you can simply reach out to me. We'll let you know the e-transfer details if you want to contribute and support. Now, getting to the agenda of the Game Sports Show podcast here tonight. Look, it, it's, it's an action-packed agenda, and I'm going to try to do segment one here in under 25 minutes. That is my goal. I'm going to be honest with you. 
I have done a recording for segment one already, and it was 57 minutes. And I said to myself that 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 this can't be the thing. I'm going to make this a little shorter. I've done it. I've done one recording already. I, I know I'll make the second one better because I want to make sure not only do I keep your interest, that it's more of that quality of content instead of quantity and just that amount, right? We want to make sure uh, that we get to the point. And speaking of getting to the point, we're talking the agenda. Segment one, we're going to be talking purely hockey, okay? I am going to mention some points about news around the National Hockey League because we were supposed to have a top shelf segment here tonight. However, we are altering our schedule and we had a Game Sports Show podcast upload instead. So I will give you some of that hockey news that you're craving that you would have heard on our top shelf segment. Uh, we'll talk about the uh, Connor Bedard sweepstakes and now that we know where he's likely going. We're going to talk about Arizona. And yes, I am going to talk about round three. All of those three points are going to be very, very brief because segment one is going to be invaded by the Toronto Maple Leafs content. Yes, I've been getting texts. I've been getting emails. No, I haven't been really getting emails, but I mean Facebook messages and notes on my emails because I've been getting Facebook messages. I've been getting reached out to on uh, Instagram and talking to people out in the community when I'm out and seeing them. And there's been a lot of questions about what I feel about Toronto. I've been really brushing off the, the, that question. It's certainly been a, a, only certain people have known how I feel about the Toronto Maple Leafs, not, not just members of my household, but some friends. And I'm going to share what I think today because truthfully, Toronto Maple Leafs news has been invading the Toronto media and invading the hockey world still, even if they're not playing now. They're still all over TikTok. They're still all over Instagram, Sportsnet, TSN, ESPN, CBC, doesn't matter. It's all about Toronto still. We're hearing about it. And I just want to give you my take on it. Why not throw my hat in the ring with all this Toronto media that you're hearing? And I hope that you take value in my points and don't hesitate to leave your feedback below. But that will be segment one. Segment two, we will have baseball chat. Okay, yours truly and will be joined by Connor Henderson. He is co-host, TGEM, and TGSS baseball analyst Sorry, and part of the Strike Zone podcast with yours truly. We haven't had a Strike Zone podcast yet this year. Uh, it's been because of schedule conflicts. Connor is extremely busy where he is right now because of work and studies and yours truly with a lot going on. But we will have a Strike Zone podcast official upload at the beginning of June. So we figured segment two, we need to have some time. Let's talk baseball. Let's give you that baseball news you wanted to hear. So it will be a Strike Zone segment on the Game Sports Show podcast here today. So... Let's get into segment one, okay? The segment that you're likely waiting for. And I'm going to get the first couple topics out of the way. Well, three topics, not a couple. Firstly, round three predictions. Look, Carolina's playing Florida. Going to be a good series. Paul Maurice is against the Carolina Hurricanes, a team he used to coach uh, coach for. Obviously, got Rod Brindamore. It's a little cool story. Paul coached, uh, Paul coached Rod when he was on Carolina. And if you remember, uh, the, the Carolina Hurricanes were without TiVo Teravine, and he's back in the lineup for Carolina in this series where we didn't think he'd be back. Look, this is going to be a very exciting series. It's not two teams I thought would be there. Truthfully, I did predict Carolina-Toronto. To go back to my, my predictions at the beginning of the season, Carolina-Toronto was my prediction in the third round this year, and then I said that I didn't want to jinx anything or say who I truly thought was going to win at the time. And to spoil that, I truly thought Carolina was going to be the winner against Toronto at that time. But as the playoffs neared and as we got into the playoffs, I thought Toronto was cup bound this year. Um, honestly, Carolina, Florida is what we're talking about. Toronto's done. I'm going to use time to talk about Toronto anyways. Carolina will beat Florida in six. Yes, I've questioned Florida against Boston. I've questioned Florida against Toronto. I called Toronto in six on Florida. Didn't happen. Carolina, I just got that feeling. Carolina is got some bodies coming back while well, Juan with Tivo Teravainen. Uh, the goaltending is a little bit questionable, of course, but I like how the way Carolina's built. They've been playing against Florida this year. I think they've obviously they've played them the most uh, outside of uh, teams in their division. Uh, the Carolina Hurricanes are a team to be reckoned with right now. They're well coached, just like Florida is. It's going to be a great series, truthfully. I think it's going to be entertaining, uh, but I'm calling it Carolina in six. Now you got Vegas and you got the Dallas Stars. Look, Edmonton Oilers fans, I'm sorry. To, we have analysts on the show that are Oilers fans. We have members of the TGEM family even um, that are Oilers fans. And I thought they were going to be Vegas. I, I thought that I thought we were going to finally see another all Canadian final. That was my prediction last round. Obviously that was wrong. And that's what the two cup favorites were. I'm sure that was a lot of other people's predictions would have been great. Would have been great for hockey, but it's not going to happen. Vegas has made the cup finals before. And recently Dallas has won the cup before and they've made it recently as well. 
Sioux native Colin Miller is on Dallas. Amadio is a Sioux native as well on Vegas. Paul Maurice, Sioux native, coach of the Florida Panthers. Nick Cousins, former Sioux St. Marie Greyhound, not from Sioux St. Marie. Uh, but overall, we got a lot of Sioux representation in the Stanley Cup uh, remaining four teams, which is very exciting. Those of you who are not from Sault Ste. Marie and you listen to the game sports, you have no idea where we're located. We're located in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, heart of the Great Lakes. Uh, and it's good to see a lot of representation of Sault Ste. Marie in this uh, playoffs in the final four here. But uh, the the Western Conference and the Eastern Conference finals, I think there's a difference in excitement. I think Florida and Carolina is going to be the more exciting series, but I am picking Vegas to defeat the Dallas Stars, and I think it's going to go seven games. I think it's going to be a wicked series, uh, but you're going to end up seeing Carolina and Vegas in the Stanley Cup finals. And then I'll save my prediction afterwards for a future top shelf segment, I should say. Connor Bedard is likely going to the Blackhawks. Let me tell you, any rumors out there if the Hawks are going to move the pick, I don't think I've really seen much. I've seen a couple random no-name type articles, but it's not happening. They've already sold a bunch of season tickets. Connor Bedard is going to the Chicago Blackhawks. It's a franchise changing, franchise changing, my apologies, and it's a passionate fan base. He's on our original six team, so that's a way to look at it. Uh, but the other side of it, it's unfortunate that it is Chicago because of how I feel the quite sour taste in my mouth of all the scandals that have been going on with them and how other teams got punished and I don't really feel like they did. And, they, you know, was this fixed? A lot of people are saying how this is fixed and the ESPN recording, how it skipped to beat it. We, know, we knew who had the third pick before they even picked it. Look, you can question all the fix you want. We can change it. He's going to Chicago. I do wish he was a Vancouver Canuck. That would have been nice if Vancouver got that uh, that draft pick, but it's not going to happen. It is Chicago. He is a Hawk, and we get to see him on an original six team, so that is pretty exciting. Let's think of it that way. Even though the Blackhawks right now, in my opinion, should be an organization that should be quite ashamed of themselves, and I consider them a joke organization, despite all the success they've had in the 2010s and the players that they had, what happened for them in the, when they won their first cup, that's a story that is absolutely sickening and that makes you lose respect for an organization. So they got a lot of repairs to do. And now it just expediates the rebuild. They've been rewarded with Connor Bedard. I don't think it was fixed, but it is unfortunate that they did get the first overall pick. I'll say it as a fan, but as a host of a sports show, I'm going to say the Hawks did get the first pick and it is franchise altering. Lastly, Arizona. What a joke of this, of, of an organization. I have said this for years, Arizona, could, should not be in Arizona. They voted against having the arena there. They need to move. Get the hell out of town. Quebec, Kansas, Houston. I don't give a fuck. Go wherever you want to go. I see Patrick Mahomes in Kansas, uh, the, the, the Kansas, Ki- uh, Kansas City Coyotes. I like it. His wife is involved with the Royals. Let, let's do it. I'm fine with that. If you want to go to Houston, whatever. I would really like to see it in Quebec City. I think Quebec City bringing back the Nordiques would be really cool. Uh, I think it'd be a passionate fan base. Would a lot of players go there? I don't know. You might end up like a Winnipeg situation. I don't know. Uh, but uh, or I, I don't think another team should go to Ontario. I think having Ottawa and Toronto there is enough. Um, don't think it's necessary despite the money you can have. There's opportunities in other cities, both in Canada and the United States. So my first pick would be, would be to be in Quebec. And I even got another one. Why not Halifax? It'd be great to see one out there. I think they would thrive with a hockey team. But those aren't going to happen, those first two. It's going to be Kansas or it's going to be Houston or heck probably even back to Atlanta before those other two happen. So where do I got to pick? If I got to choose between Kansas and Houston, I'm saying, why not? Let's go to Kansas city. Let's go to Missouri. Let's give it a shot there. Missouri. You have, uh, you'll have a good little battle there between St. Louis and Kansas. That'd be really, really neat to see. And if it's Houston, they got a big hockey market there. Potentially. Why not give that a go? Either way, it's good. Uh, but Kansas city coyotes has a good ring to it. The Houston coyotes also do, but get the hell out of Arizona. All right, now, the moment you all been waiting for, and we're 14 minutes into the first segment, I said I want to try to keep this at a 25 minutes. So I'm going to try to talk about Toronto in a 10-minute window, which was a challenge. I did 55 minutes in my first recording that I've scrapped. The The Toronto Maple Leafs, okay, it, it's very it's a very interesting situation, okay? And this is a part of the show right now where I'm sure is the reason why you clicked it. You saw the thumbnail. You saw the title of the show. Those of you who are friends are probably waiting for me. You got your popcorn ready. You got your drink. You're going to wait for me to get red face, maybe cry, maybe shed a few tears, uh, whatever it may be. But I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to speak to you honestly from the heart. I'm going to have my host hat on, and I'm going to have my fan hat on here. So it's going to go multiple directions. Okay, so firstly, 
Toronto did outshoot Florida in a lot of games in their series. But Florida was just the better looking team. Toronto has the better team on paper, but hustle and hard work will beat talent if talent doesn't work hard. That's a lot of quotes that I've been seeing a lot about Toronto. It's one that I was thinking right when I was watching it, so I didn't take that from anywhere. It's actually one I was thinking about. It's a quote that I heard a lot throughout my hockey career. Um, the 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 talent that was on the ice for Toronto, the big big guys didn't show up. Matthews, Nylander showed up a little bit. I think Nylander's arguably been the best playoff performer in Toronto for the last couple of years, despite how lazy he may look on the ice. Tavares, Marner, you know, Marner had a big goal in game four, you know, to kind of solidify the win, to be able to go back to Toronto for game five, just to hold out the misery of Toronto fans. But Toronto lost to Florida in a surprising way. Myself, I thought that Toronto would win in six. Experts at Toronto winning in four, five, six, seven, doesn't matter. Nobody believed in Florida. And Florida gets away with the series and gets the W. They were the better looking team, despite getting outshot. They were hardworking. They were tenacious. They capitalized on their opportunities, and that's why they're moving on. Toronto's game where they couldn't bounce back was after game two. That game was that's that was the loss right there. That was a loss that I feel was the pivotal point in the series that is geared up for game three. Then after losing game three in overtime, after Sammy goes down, Wall went in, did a great job. He did a fantastic job in games uh, four and five. Uh, the 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 Leafs were behind after that. That was a turning point of the series. The biggest thing is Sergei Bobrovsky. Bobrovsky was on the case. Okay. Bobrovsky was playing like Vesna Bob in that. He was unbelievable. And he's not even that good this season. He, he hasn't lived up to the contract. And all of a sudden, it's like he woke up out of bed and said, hmm, I am five, six, seven years younger. I am what I used to be. I will be the best goalie in the world today. That is like what happened when it woke up, and he was unbeatable. It played a factor. No matter what it is, the goaltending played a factor. Just like with Joseph Wall in Game 5. Do I think Sammy could have did the same? No, I don't know. I really don't think the way Sammy, how he was battling injury, Wall wasn't the reason why Toronto lost, and goaltending can win you games. Wall's not the reason why Toronto lost in overtime. There's other reasons. Bobrovsky played that little bit better. made that little extra better save at the end, that, that bigger save in overtime to be able to allow Florida to score. Bobrovsky outplayed both Toronto goaltenders. He was the better goalie in this series, and that helps when your goalie has a 93-plus save percentage and is completely unbeatable. You will win a majority of your games, despite getting outshot, shot, especially with your goalie having those statistics. Now, I did say that I picked Toronto to win in six. I was wrong. It's funny that former Greyhound Nick Cousins got the winner. And it was literally in the of the hands of Nick Cousins, but it was also literally in the hands of Radko Gudis. I don't know if anybody else gets my pun there, but that leads me to my second point, the refs. Oh, my goodness, the refereeing. Okay, so I'm not one to, to, to get upset about the refereeing and use it as an excuse, but I'm going to tell you, the refereeing in this National Hockey League playoffs, 2023 playoffs, has been a fucking joke. It's been a joke for the Toronto series. It was a joke for the Oilers-Vegas series. It was a joke in the Tampa Toronto series when Wes McCauley was there. Such a carnival it was when Wes McCauley refing the Leafs, and he still went back to ref another Leaf game in which Toronto lost again, by the way. They haven't won a game with Wes, Wes refing. But the refereeing was so inconsistent. It's it's like what Alex Parr says, who's an analyst here on the TGM and, uh, and TGSS for hockey and general sports analysts. He said, it's so challenging to be able to watch a sport you just don't know what a penalty is after watching it for your entire life. And you know what? You call in refs or call in penalties. There's a lot of armchair GMs or a lot of armchair refs that say, oh, that's a penalty. That's a penalty. And I know there's a lot of ref lovers out there. And look, I respect the, the, the art of refereeing. It's a very big challenge. It's not easy to do. But when you're refereeing the National Hockey League, there's very, very little room for error. And your one effect changes the whole entire outcome of a game. And that's the human element. Right, That's the human element of it. But the refereeing in the National Hockey League playoffs has been a joke. It was a joke. And literally going to my point where I said, again, using the L word there, literally, the hands of Radko Gudis, play that back. Grabbing Yarn Crook's stick, he would have been able to swing his stick and maybe get the puck off Nick Cousins' stick and at least go back the other way. All right, Or maybe he doesn't get it off his stick and Nick Cousins still scores. Who knows? But that is a penalty. 
And then Gudis is yelling at Wall's face. Oh, my goodness. I don't care. Listen, Gudis would kick my ass. He'd kick my ass up and down the street here where I live. But if I saw him do that, no matter if I knew I lost the series, I would fucking run him. And if you hear this podcast, Radko, I don't give a shit, man. What you did yelling in Wool's face, intentional or not, it, despite having that emotion, that is a fucking classless act. And if I'm Toronto, I am rattled. I don't know how Yarn Crook or even Wool didn't take a punch out of his face and beat the snot out of him. I, I think that is a joke. I, I think that was classless. But that's not even what I'm mad about. It happened. He They scored. What caused... Me to be mad about Radko Gudis is what caused the goal. The non-call for the holding the stick. That is a penalty. Doesn't matter if it was a high a chance on a defensive play. He grabbed Yarncrook's stick. He interfered with his ability to try to attempt to play the defensive side of the puck and to stop a chance for a high-scoring chance. So that is a penalty. And the refs were there. You can see that if you're looking, but the refs too busy looking at the puck. As the ref, you got to be knowing to watch the play around the surrounding play. And I asked the ref. I'm not going to throw his name under the under the bus. He's a ref who is not from Sault Ste. Marie. I don't want because I know there's people that know that I know people in the Sioux that are referees. This guy was from out of town, and he indicated that that was a goal. It seemed like, but he said that's not even the point. The penalties that w- should have been called in the series were when Gudis ran, ran David Camp which was like what I do when I play NHL 23 with Parr and Dane. After the whistle, we laugh about how we hit people like that because you'd be you'd be put on trial. Kampf gets absolutely rocked. No penalty. That's a suspension. Gudis, Gudis should have been gone. But that play against Yarncrook, as the referee, and I should read it quote-unquote, but I've read enough times before this upload to say it quote-unquote. Gudis should have been called for two minutes on holding the stick. The referee is responsible to be able to watch the play and the surrounding play. The ref, if you look at the replay, you can tell he's watching Cousins. There's not enough observation about what's going on around the net. And the view, the way Gudis was holding the stick, the ref should have had the ability to see that. And if he doesn't, he needs to be able to put himself in a position to know that. And now that may sound complicating to people that be like, oh, how do you think of that mid-game? That's why he's in the ref in the NHL refereeing because he knows how to put himself in those positions, and that wasn't the case. There's a lot of missed calls, a lot of inconsistent calls, and I've talked a lot about Toronto here, but in the whole National Hockey League playoffs, Petrangelo and Drysaitel, are you kidding me? Says one game suspension. What a joke! What a joke! The, the NHL needs to figure out something. I don't know if even though it takes away the human element or it takes uh, the the momentum out of the game, maybe a coach's challenge on a referee non-call. I don't know because. It is so very unfortunate that that can change the outcome of a game in the playoffs. Look, like I said, what if the least, what if Yarn Crook does poke that away from Cousins? Gudis is a defenseman playing forward now. Cousins is up, the other forward is up. Now the Leafs go back three on one, three on two, whatever, sorry, basic math. And then they score. They're going back to Florida with all the momentum, and now we have a sixth game in Florida. See, the, things can change in one play, and you have to make the right call. Again, human element is a factor, and it's a part of the game. But there's calls that you have to make, and that is a call you have to make. The camp after the whistle hit, the worst one of the worst hits I've seen, and that holding the stick call and other calls throughout the entirety of the game. Head checks throughout the series, nothing called. Bennett on Matthew Nyes can custom out for the remainder of the series, and he gets only a fine. Bunting gets cross-checked. Heck, if Bunting does that, if Bunting's gone for three games. Very inconsistent by the referee and George Perelson in the in the in the, in the player's safety. Most of my upset side is towards the refereeing, but there is a lot about the lease I still have to get to. So to wrap up the second point about the refereeing, they need to be better. It was a joke. It affected the Toronto series. It affected other series. Would have Toronto came back and beat Florida? I'm not saying they would have, but at least the game would have been called. If it could have been called more consistent, consistently, never mind fair, it would have been a little bit less ranting here on my end about the refereeing, but get it together. NHL needs to figure something out. What a joke. Now, my reaction about the Leafs, okay, what do I want? Very simple. I want them to run it back. Same core. Just like Don Cherry said. He said it on his podcast. He said that you run this back. There just needs to be a compliment of the right guys around them is my thought. And yes, truly this team did have some compliment. Achari, Lafferty, O'Reilly was a massive get. But it's still missing that necessary piece. O'Reilly playing on the top six was not the play you play him on the third line center, which is more effective. 
but it still leaves that top six area vacant, especially when Matthew Nyes got hurt. Nyes would have been, I think, more effective on the third line if he was healthy with a Michael Bunty, okay, uh, or or or, or Nor- Nola Chari, whatever it would have been, because Bunty likely would have played on the top six. You need to bring in something that is going to be that missing piece, okay? Despite how Matthew Nyes would have helped in the series, you need to bring in something. So I say run it back, extend Matthews, Put Murray in LTIR, re-sign Sammy, go with Wall and Sammy, and run that back. The wish list to add, in my request, is to bring in Tom Wilson. I think it's an affordable contract. I think uh, Washington would be willing to move him. He's had some health concerns, but I think with the right rehabilitation and the right fall-through throughout playing this year, I think there could be an option there, and there could be some chance for some salary retention to leave us some cap relief. And run that back with that. Bring back Ryan O'Reilly, Luke Shen, and Nola Chari. So let me re- let me recoup that for you. Resign Luke Shen, Achari, and O'Reilly. Resign Sammy Murray on LTIR. Extend Matthews. Go with Wall and Sammy next year and trade for Tom Wilson. That's what I think needs to get done. Run that back. Bring back Nylander. Bring back Dubas and fuck it. Bring back Keith. If they tr- if they did fire Keith and bring in somebody else, that's fine. I'm okay with that. But run back with this core. Alex Ovechkin, Steven Stamkos, they didn't win a cup for over a decade. If you remember correctly, yeah, Washington won a lot of first rounds, but they lost in the second round a lot to the, guess who? Pittsburgh Penguins. Crosby beat them every time. Every time Crosby beat them. Is Pitts, is Toronto like Washington? Eh. Well, Ovechkin's a very good goal scorer, just like Austin Matthews is. Nicholas Backstrom, great playmaker. What's Mitch Marner? Great playmaker. They've had that second line center rotation. Look at Tavares and look at, uh, uh, I said, well, Marner is a lot, it can be that playmaker that you look at, but look at William Nylander. They have a similar makeup. Carlson and Morgan Riley. I would say Carlson at that point is better than Morgan Riley, but you still have a similar kind of layout, in my honest opinion. Run this back. You have to believe in this core because it, they're, they're still young. Yes, the, th- the window's getting really, really small, especially I think last next year is probably the window where it's going to close. And you've had six years of not success. I get it. You haven't got out of the first round. You finally did. You win one game in the second round, and, and it's the first time in 19 years that the team has done it. Look, ultimately, the to run it back with these guys is the right decision. People may think I'm crazy, may think that's stupid, but they had a 50-plus win year, over 110 points, there's still some pieces missing. I think after this loss in the second round, we know what that is. It's round up the top six with more of those hungry guys, those, those eager guys that are going to get those guys going. And we have to find a way to get Matthews and Elander and those guys going. And I think the right fit, like a Tom Wilson, I think an extra piece on that second line, a, a second first line will be a good piece. And I think this core can truly do it. I really think this team can win a Stanley Cup. This core can do it. And I'll be sad if it's not ran back the same. It makes me think, what if Matthews and Nylander aren't there next year? You know, I remember how excited Lee fans were when we got Matthews and how we, when we got Tavares. And that was just a short sec, six, seven, whatever years ago. The time flew by. What, are we going to go back to a rebuild and retool and maybe hopefully count on McDavid leaving the Oilers in a few years ago to Toronto? Look, give your head a shake. We have the core here. We have a team that we can build and be a successful playoff team for a number of years, and this team can win the cup with this core. It can happen. So here are the next steps. First, you need the GM situation figured out. In which that will figure out the coaching situation. So that's number two. And figure those two points out fast. As soon as the Stanley Cup's rewarded, you better have that decided on what's going on. Because the draft is just around the corner from that. And free agency. Then when that's decided, you address the Austin Matthews situation. Those are the three core starting points. At which point, here will be the scenarios. Matthews doesn't resign. And yes, I have this notice. I'm going to reserve my notes because I don't want to miss anything. Matthews doesn't resign, so you got to trade him. If Matthews doesn't extend slash resign, July 1st is a full no movement. You have a full year without him having a contract, and it's going to be a distraction. Heck, he'll probably put up 60 goals again. Heck, maybe he wins the Stanley Cup. Maybe that's a good thing. Who knows? But I don't think you can go a full year with Austin Matthews being on a one-year remaining on his deal. You have to move him. You have to get something for him. Because if he doesn't resign now or the interest isn't there now, what's going to change at the end of the year? 
Look what happened with the Islanders with Tavares. Okay? Matthews, if he doesn't resign, you trade him before July 1. Maybe you trade him to the Ducks for second overall pick and something else. I don't know if the Ducks would do that. Just an example. Maybe you trade him uh, to the Los Angeles Kings because obviously he would probably re-sign there. It's California, uh, and they have a lot of good prospects you could probably pick apart from the Los Angeles Kings. If you want to look at Byfield, if you want to look at uh, – there, there's more there's more of a fit there that you can look at. Clark, there's there's prospects that they have in their system that you can look at retooling um, and quickly revamping your prospect pool. But I don't want that to happen. I truly don't. But that is number one. If Matthews doesn't resign, you trade him. Okay? And then at which time after Matthews is traded if he doesn't resign? That means Nylander's gone too. And you address to att- you attempt to address these holes in free agency or through trade with Matthews and Nylander gone. You'd be foolish... But you know what? That could be scenario one. Scenario two, Matthews does resign, but Nylander gets traded. You bring in a top pick or a defenseman, and you look at free agency to fill this hole if you can find the cap. Scenario three, Matthews does resign. You keep Nylander as an own rental, run it back, and improve what you have around this core. Yes, doing this again. And we may be back in the same spot. But like I said, run it back, that's what point three means. Look, Marner and Tavares are not going nowhere. Truthfully, if one person gets traded, it's William Nylander. It's an affordable contract. Despite having one year left, he can score goals. Despite being lazy, he's actually been the least best playoff performer, as I mentioned. Ultimately, he has value right now, and his value is at an all-time high because of this year alone and what he has been able to do and what he could do to round out a top six on a team that may be a cup contender or maybe missing some forwards, Colorado Avalanche. This is the right time to trade Nylander if you're going to do it. So if you are going to really, truly trade someone, which I said again, I'll say it again, run it back, You got I think Nylander's the guy that you trade. Now, despite that I do say run it back, if Nylander is traded, like I said, I'm okay with it. But it has to be for something of equal return or value if it's a high draft pick or a top defenseman, which may be too much of a price for Willie. Those are the scenarios. Those are the three scenarios and some points. If there's one I'm missing, tell me. Comment below. But let's be real. It all starts with the coach and the GM situation figured out and Austin Matthews. After this is figured out, buckle up. Because even if Matthews resigns and do with some Kiefer term, I think there's going to be some moves and, do, and the Leafs are going to be busy. But if Dubas and Keefe aren't back and someone new comes back and Matthews isn't resigned, my goodness, it's going to be the biggest offseason in Toronto Maple Leaf history. It's going to be something. By July 1, we'll know what's going on and we'll see what happens then. Buckle up, like I said. Overall, my wish list this offseason, I did mention something earlier, but I'll say it again. It's resigning Matthews, trading for Tom Wilson, bringing back some pieces from this year's deadline, such as Shen, Achari, and O'Reilly. If possible, if a trade could happen, uh, if, it, if it truly is, will he so be it, or the rights to someone, and look at bringing in a top four D-man to round out Riley, Brody, and McCabe. Um, Shannon Timmons, I think, would be great for the third pairing, and I think Lilligren's tradable. Uh, so I think if you can bring in another defenseman, that will involve having to trade someone because cap does not come easy. Um, with running this core back, I would like the way the Leafs are, are, would shape out. That's what I'll say. Side notes, uh, if Bunting asks for more than three or three and a half million, I would be even hesitant on three and a half, say goodbye. I don't care how many points. He came into Toronto. He got given an opportunity. League men, he's done pretty well. Obviously, he was a runner-up for Rookie of the Year. Very aged rookie, let me tell you. Uh, he's had a good, he has good chemistry. Last year, he did anyways with Matthews and Marner. That hasn't really trans, uh, transferred over to this year. He struggled. He's up and down the lineup. I think he's a third-line guy. I wouldn't pay him more than three. I mean, having a Bunting, O'Reilly, Achari third line would be really good, but anything higher than three, three and a half, say goodbye to Bunting. Uh, and I am so excited to say, and it better be official, if I see Justin Hall re-sign in Toronto, I am going to throw a lot of my items out my window just for fun because I'll be so upset. That guy should not be playing in the National Hockey League. I'm going to be honest with you. He will sign somewhere, I am sure, but it better not be in Toronto. That's another part of my wish list. And Kerfoot. Listen, if he comes back on league minimum, I would take him back. 800K, 12, 13 forward in out of the lineup, that's fine, but let's get real. There hasn't been a fit for him in the lineup, and he's not going to take league min. So that's not going to happen, 
and I think he's going to move on. So no more Kerfoot, no more Hall, no more Bunting. I am okay with that. With my wish list, with having a full season of Nyes and maybe a healthy Robertson and Bobby McMahon being in the bottom six, mm, I'm liking that. Run it back with those wishes. Oh, Then you can start saying cut bound, like Coach Chippy says on TikTok. Those are my scenarios, my notes, and my points. Look, vent below as you will. And now, look, let me tell you this. Toronto losing, I'm upset. I Against Montreal when they blew the 3-1 uh, lead. Nope, 4-1 was in 2013 against Boston. The 3-1 lead to Montreal, that was the most embarrassing moment as a Leaf fan. It was more embarrassing than losing to the Boston Bruins being up 4-1 the third period. Montreal, no, no credit against them. They had Carey Price in that. They had Shea Weber. They had some guys really step up, but Toronto should have won that series. They were the better team. They were great all year, and they just collapsed. Columbus, the year before Montreal, what the hell was that? Absolute joke. Uh, but last year against Tampa, losing in seven, yeah, I was upset. It was a joke because you lost again in the first round, but that was a good hockey team. A lot of teams that Toronto plays, for some reason, they end up in the Stanley Cup Finals. What's that tell you? Toronto's got a good team. The teams they play are good. Their division's really good. And it doesn't matter as much as people dislike the division alignment and the playoffs goes. It doesn't matter. Toronto, even with the old format from 1-8, to eight, Toronto still would have had to play Tampa Bay. So either way, you've got to beat the best to get to the finals. And they didn't do that this year. And despite what happened this year losing to Florida and me being upset, I am happy that I got to see the second round for the first time in 19 years. In 2004, I wasn't even 13 years old yet because my birthday's in August and it happened just before May. So I was 12 years old the last time I saw the Toronto Maple Leafs in the, in the second round of the Stanley Cup playoffs. Jeremy Roenick got that winner over Eddie Balfour. I was in my parents' basement watching it with my parents and I remember how mad myself and my dad were, okay? And this is what I signed up for. You know, I've seen the Leafs lose in the conference finals. I've seen the Leafs uh, come close and not do it. I've seen... Uh, I've seen a lot before 2004. Then since 2004, that hasn't been really too much to cheer for to the exception of being good hockey teams the past number of years and getting to the playoffs. But then there's been disappointment after the first round exit. They got to the second round. They beat Tampa. They slayed that demon. I think the other demon is you got to, you got or, or the dragon, sorry, that you got to slay is the Boston Bruins. But Florida got in the way of that. The We got to see the second round for the first time in 19 years. Sometimes that's, for, for some, that's the first time anyone's ever seen Toronto in the second round. For some, it's been the 19 years, like I said, but it's progress. We've seen the progress, and there's just some more pieces that have to be added on top of what was already added. As much as that sounds like a lot, it's been a compliment. It's been a, just, a, a positive adjustment for us uh, to, to be a part of. They've, they've tried to get better. Dubas has tried to get better despite some bad trades, despite some bad signings. It all happens. These are good players that we're seeing on Toronto, and they can do it, as I've said numerous times. But as a fan base, I understand I've had a week or almost whatever, a week or so to really digest this. And I'm upset. I'm up to the point where I'm just in that disbelief. I remember sitting on the couch just staring there because it's like you expect it now. You expect it as a Leaf fan to have disappointment. You expect to not see it. And then we take it out and us as fans are, are very upset at the players and call out for this person's head, this person's firing. But we forget to really see what really happened this year. We saw... Some great moments. We saw a team get another 50-plus win season. We've seen the first round demons get slayed. And, yeah, we won, it's like we won the Stanley Cup after the first round, and we were getting chirped about it. So be it. There was There's some good to look back this year and to build off of. Let's be happy we got to see the second round and got to see five more games of hockey because that's five more games that we didn't get to see the past 19 years, let alone even more than that when we didn't even make it to the playoffs. And that may be the corny way out. It may not be what you were expecting for me to talk about. You may be expecting me to blow a gasket. But I had my Leaf jerseys all hung up to the exception of my autograph ones on my jer- uh, the Sport Displays jersey mount. And in the flawless roofing closet right there, I have a jersey that I put away. And until next year, as a Leaf fan, I'm a sucker for pain. I signed up for this. It's going to be worth seeing them win. It's going to it's going to happen eventually. It has to. If it does, if I go a lifetime without seeing it, at least I can say that I believed in a team the entirety of my life. And despite how, like I said, corny and sad that may sound, there is something to look forward to with this team. And if it all blows up, I'm scared to see what the future would be because I think there's a chance here. And ultimately, as fans, we have something special here. And we got to see the second round this year. Yeah, it should have been more, could have been more. But remember that moment after they passed the first round. 
Now wait until they do get past the second round next year. And yeah, I'm saying that. And then the time when they win, how that will feel. It's been special this year. It has. And despite how we should see more, we're not seeing more. It's heartbreaking. I said I was sad. I can't even show it. I'm in such disbelief. I'm my, my, my confidence and everything is just sucked right out of me. It's like you expect it now, which is sad. We, we settle for disappointment. And I'm hoping that narrative changes. I've said this to friends. Change the narrative should have been the slogan for this playoffs. And it did. There was narrative that changed, but there's some that was rewritten. Let's proceed on changing the narrative. And let's change the narrative, narrative as fans. We can have our thoughts, have our feelings. Let's do it. There's a lot of people who have mixed feelings, and I get it. I'm over being sad. I'm over being mad. I'm over yelling at my television. I'm over I'm over it. I've been over it since the Montreal series, truthfully. But I will come back every year and cheer for this team because that's what we do. No matter through what, no matter through thick and thin, we will do it. And there were positives this year. All right, that's 41 minutes. That's me talking about Toronto for an hour and a half because, like I said at the beginning of this upload, I did a recording prior, and I scrapped that recording because I wasn't pleased with it. Now I'm doing another one that's 41 minutes. I am happier with this one, mind you, uh, but either way, doesn't matter. So much to talk about with Toronto. That's all you've been hearing on the media, so I apologize you had to hear more here from me, but I imagine everything that I said, I think everything I said makes sense, and if you're a true Toronto fan, Buckle up. It's going to be an interesting offseason. And it's time to look into the future. And let's hope for a 2023-2024 season that brings us more joy past the second round this time. But way too early to tell. That's for sure. Let me know below what you think for some changes. Connect with me if you want. Feel free. This is the Game Sports Show podcast powered by the Game Entertainment and Media. Sponsors for this uh, upload is Flawless Roofing Church Seal Incorporated. Protect your investment. Start at the top. The sport displays and the jersey mount product. Hang up your jersey or shirt anywhere in your household or anywhere. Easily removable and changeable. The sport displays. Check them out. FlawlessRoofing.ca and the sportdisplays.com. Make sure you like, follow, and subscribe on the Game Sports Show audio platforms and the TGM Network YouTube channel. Uh, make sure you check out previous editions of the Game Sports Show. There's been the recent special edition upload with Alex Bolduc. There will be some content coming up as well in terms of Top Shelf and more segments. And make sure you check out TGM for more content that is going on there from the Average Jocks podcast, the Bitter Rivals podcast, not just the Game Sports Show. Lots of content on there. And if you have a podcast, please don't hesitate to reach out to be aired on the TGM Network YouTube channel. Speaking of TGM, there will be a name change to TGM, as I said numerous times. That name change will be announced before June the 5th. Very excited about that. Despite a name change, doesn't mean anything's changing. The only thing that's changing is the name. So I'm David McKaig with the Game Sports Show podcast. I am co-founder of the Game Sports Show and host of the Game Sports Show podcast. I'm going to take a quick breather. When I get back, as I promised, it's segment two. We're going to be talking baseball. We're going to have the strike zone segment here uh, on the Game Sports Show. We're bringing in Connor Henderson. So for those... Uh, who want to vent more about the Leafs, you're going to have to wait and reach out to me in private or just comment below. But for now, let's table that. Let's take a breather and let's bring in Connor Henderson. Don't go anywhere. And welcome back to the Game Sports Show. It is your host, David McCaig Jr., continuing the Game Sports Show podcast. This is segment two of tonight's upload. Now, without further ado, I want to bring in the guest here in segment two, Everyone who's listened to the Game Sports Show from the audio days to the now audio and video days knows that we have a baseball podcast called Strike Zone. It has been yours truly along with this very handsome individual, well-knowledged baseball individual, well-known in Sault Ste. Marie in baseball. He's coached baseball. And finally, we get to talk baseball here on the Game Sports Show podcast. And without further ado, before I get into all the news, because everyone knows I can go down a rabbit hole if I start talking, the one and only Connor Henderson. Connor, my friend, finally able to get this going. And despite not being an official Strike Zone episode, it's a segment here on the Game Sports Show podcast. We want to make sure we get the listeners some baseball. How you doing, my friend? Great to see you. It's great to see you too, Dave. I'm worried now. You've been pumping my tires about being, you know, like this fabulously looking machismo. When I come out here looking like a scrub, I got my workout shirt on. Uh, I had to throw on a hat because the hair's disheveled. But it's great <laughs> to see you. And I'm really excited to get rolling here. 
Man, I was fine if you want to not wear the hat. Like Elliot Friedman, obviously, uh, did an interview today that I saw on uh, on a Toronto outlet, we'll say, and his hair was just like out to here. Okay, so that guy gives no fucks. I don't think we should do. I think we should follow the same suit one day. Maybe not do our hair, uh, but nonetheless, we got baseball to talk about. I want to educate the listeners a little bit about the Strike Zone podcast. It's our fourth year officially doing it this year. It's our first year on video. Fun fact, uh, we've done it on audio. You can listen to, uh, to previous episodes on all of our audio platforms as uh, we don't have a website for the Game Sports Show anymore. We've discontinued that as we're going to be launching a new website with our Powered By sponsor, which will have a new name soon as well. So the Strike Zone podcast has been around four years. We've had a couple sponsors in there uh, who have been a part of it. Now we have it brought to you by Flawless Roofing. They've got the calendar in the background there. We've got the trophy right there to my right. The T-Gem Pandas trophy for the men's league baseball. So it's all fit suit here. But here on the Strike Zone podcast, we talk everything baseball. That is, if we're talking the Algoma region, for those who are in Sault Ste. Marie, uh, for any news that we get for that. But we mostly talk about the professional level baseball uh, in the major leagues. And Connor and I talk about a lot of scandals that happen a lot of the time. We talk about all the hot news, but we also just get our you get to hear our expertise, and I use the air quotes there for myself, more so Connor, as he leads and quarterbacks the way uh, for the world of baseball. So I wanted to tell people what the strike zone is. Obviously, this isn't the first official episode, but we are going to count it as it uh, because we haven't done a strike zone episode by itself yet because of schedule conflict. We wanted to make sure that all the listeners were able to enjoy some baseball content here on the Game Sports Show because we talk everything here on the game. We will have strike zone in independent uploads that I can assure you uh, in the coming weeks and throughout the summer you won't get uh, let's just say uh, you'll have a lot of baseball content coming your way with the game sports show Connor let's talk baseball okay like uh, actually first do you have anything to add to what I just said did I miss anything no Dave you got it all I, uh, I was I was <laughs> I'm always impressed with your ability to summarize that's why I bat lead off in baseball, and that's why you were second. Okay, I'd get on first, get to second, you'd get me home. Now it's other way around when we play men's league baseball. But I want to actually start with men's league baseball in Sault Ste. Marie. And people in this podcast that are outside the suit like, what the fuck? I don't want to hear that right now. I get it. Uh, but you know what? Local, support local. Okay, we've learned that more through COVID, how important that is. And I want to give love to the local area of Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, those in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, if you're wondering where that content is, trust me. I'm getting there, uh, but we're talking about Men's League and Sault Ste. Marie. Yes, Men's League Baseball as our Powered by Sponsor, T-Gem. Uh, we have a team called the T-Gem Pandas. There will be a name change for T-Gem, but that also means the baseball names have a, t- a name change as well. But the Pandas is remaining because that's one cool fucking name. Um, so the the what um, we will, the baseball season is starting in Sault Ste. Marie for everything. Um, you got uh, these Black Sox are starting, and I think they've actually already started practices and tryouts. Uh, the Sioux Black Sox are the select team that through all the different age groups here in Sault Ste. Marie, they've already had their tryouts as of last weekend, is what I believe those when those were or recently. Um, don't quote me on that. But we also have the men's league baseball league starting in the coming weeks as well. So baseball's just around the corner here locally, Connor, and that plays a has a cool place in your heart there so if you want to give a little bit of love to local baseball uh it's an exciting time in Sault Ste. Marie it really is this is um as full as some of the signups have ever been especially for the house league kids yeah. um it's one of those situations where and when I first got on the show I, I remember saying this to you in studio um when the Blue Jays do well our programs do well and I know the Blue Jays uh could do a lot better this season so far but they've got those you know, stars that everybody looks up to, the Vlad Guerreros, the Bo Bichettes, and that gets people really excited to go out to the park and sign their kids up. Uh, I played growing up. I did the whole competitive thing, and uh, then I did some coaching as well. It's close to me. It's close to my family. And um, excitingly enough, uh, not only have some games started playing, especially for the U18 team that's had uh, roughly four games so far on their schedule completed. They're oh, off to so a good start of three played. and one. Oh, so yeah, they, they, they did. See, I'm behind in the news. See, that's why Connor is the expert. He knows. <laughs> but we also uh, have um, the Sioux College Cougars, which had their inaugural season last year, and they're looking to build on on their program as well. That uh, is super exciting, and hopefully we'll be able to cover them as well as the uh, next coming school year rolls around. 
Yeah, we got a couple players on the the pandas that play for Sioux College. A lot of good players. And last year there was an All Star game at the end of the year, and um, it was put together by someone who's actually works on the Sioux College staff. And I was selected for it. Don't know how uh, my batting average was good, but I wasn't as good. There were some players that weren't on that roster that should have been. Uh, Bergman is one. The list goes on. Connor should have been if he was there. Uh, someone named Jordan Trudeau would have been too if he was there. There's a lot of good players that should have played. But uh, got my first all-star nod, and the college uh, Sioux College Cougars did defeat us. Uh, but a lot of those guys are pandas that are on the Cougars. So you know what? Uh, we, uh, Sioux College, uh, if they want to send the bill over uh, for the terms of the development we've been giving their uh, players, that's good. But jokes aside, it's baseball's growing here in the Sioux. And the Sioux College, I'm going to give them a little bit of credit. Sioux College is a college here in Sioux St. Marie, of course. Uh, we have two schools, Algoma University and Sioux College. Algoma U is really known for soccer and basketball. Those are their programs here at Sioux College. They're doing everything. Hockey's been fire. Uh, obviously, ba- uh, baseball's been great. Uh, Women's hockey was just unbelievable this year. So Sioux College, um, they had their season coming around, and we hope to do a lot of coverage, as Connor said. But a lot of those players play on the team that we're on in the men's league this summer, and a lot of good talent, um, and it's certainly exciting to watch. So if you're in the Sioux region or you're outside the Sioux, you want to do some investigating, it's worth the checkout uh, for sure. So throughout the year, we'll have uh, news about all the baseball that's going on. Uh, locally here in Sault Ste. Marie. And we're here better from than me talking your year off, but from an alumni himself, Connor, because truthfully, I'm not an alumni of baseball, of youth baseball in the Sioux. I'm just a men's league alumni. Um, and nonetheless, it is uh, fun to go watch and support. There's a lot of good, uh, a lot of good talent there from all age groups. Now, Connor, what I want to talk about now and get into is the major leagues, okay? And obviously, this is segment two of the Game Sports Show podcast, and we're talking strike zone. This is the strike zone segment, okay? And we're not going to have a final thought segment. So everyone loves my final thought segment here, Connor. I've been getting some texts about how heated I get about final thoughts. There's no final thoughts today, okay? Final thoughts is going to be no final thoughts. Strike zone is what you're going to hear as the last words at the end of this podcast. And we only got about seven minutes to go here. So Major League Baseball, we're going to dive into. And normally, you and I kind of talk about what we want to talk about prior. We don't follow a script. Connor can second that. We don't have a script in front of us. We give you as it is and what we know. And I want to actually start about uh, the, the, the Oakland Athletics. And the reason why I want to go there is because we haven't talked about how they're relocating to Vegas. Now, that's old news. Okay, that ha- That's been released about three weeks ago or so. We know that's happening. Long overdue because... A lot like a lot of other teams and other sports, uh, let's say categories, and if we want to compare hockey, the Arizona Coyotes, okay, and I, as people know, we talked about that in our upcoming Top Shelf segments, but the, uh, the Oakland Athletics are moving to Las Vegas. Long overdue, uh, I think that the Oakland fans, you know, there was a lot of glory days in the late 80s, of course, there was some good teams, and of course, Billy Bean had the money ball team where they had the big winning streak. It's kind of sad because everyone... Also likes Oakland because of their colors, because of their logo, right? Like it's it's so cool. There's a lot of there's a lot of nostalgia there with Oakland, but they're moving to Vegas, Connor. Uh, and I think it's a, I think it's about a matter of time that that's finally happened. Yeah, I mean we've seen that sports like hockey can thrive in Vegas. Vegas is a fun, eventful area, and if they can squeeze a little bit more life out of that franchise by relocating, then. I think it's well overdue at this point. I, they've pretty much mustered as much as they could from uh, from where they were. And I mean, when you look at the record like they have this season, um, you're looking for any piece of good news that you can get. And I think that's some of it. Uh, it's not good. It's not a good record. Now, at, at this time, as far as when we're recording, things can change. The name of Las Vegas hasn't been announced, uh, but do they go with the Vegas A's? You know, do they keep that name? I hope they do. I think it has a good ring to it still. Las Vegas Athletics, I don't think it's bad. You still have some nostalgia and history there. It's not unusual for a team to take another name as they move forward, but at the same time, it is. You know, usually you want a whole new change, right? Like when Atlanta went back to Winnipeg, they weren't called the Winnipeg Thrashers. They went to the Winnipeg Jets, obviously, and um, obviously, if you look back in the days, though, Brooklyn, they were called the Brooklyn Dodgers. Now they moved over. They were the Los Angeles Dodgers. So they, there, there has been some change where it's been the same. What do you say, Connor? Is the Las Vegas A's going to be it? Or are we looking at the Las Vegas Aces? Are they going to go with that A still and maybe go with the Aces potentially? Are they going to go that route? What are you thinking? 
You know what? I actually love that idea because then, like, you could still call them the A's, but it would be the Aces, and um, I don't know. I I feel like you always get into weird situations where, especially like in some sports, I think in football this happened where like one franchise like moved to another city, and then um, eventually when like the city that lost the franchise regained it. It's like you get into weird situations where like, what if one keeps the name and then they, they bring it back. I, don't, I think maybe in Cleveland, this might've happened or Baltimore is something like that in the Ohio region. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. Probably, yeah. Is, that, is that right? They look at St. Louis, they came the Rams out of the LA Rams, right? Like you've had the same situation, but you've had some teams, like you said, and I can't think of a top man, but you are on the right track. Uh, I know the football in the pocket lovers of the show are yelling at the microphone right now, but that's fine. Comment below if you, if you want to correct us, but we're on the right track. Like it's just, there's that, there's that, just that side where it, there's that awkwardness. If they go back, what happens? And I feel like Las Vegas wants a new identity because they're Vegas, right? That's who they are. And aces make sense because it's Vegas gambling an ace, right? It, and then they can have that retro jersey that's like an ace card. Like there's so much potential you can do with Vegas, okay? So much. Uh, but I don't think they should change the colors. They will. Uh, and I don't think they should change the logo or the name, quote unquote. They should keep that A. That A is so baseball-like. You know, it's almost like the definition of American baseball. You know, like you think of the Cubs, they got the C, the New York NY, the Boston B. Not saying Oakland Athletics are in the same class as Boston or anything like that. Don't get me wrong. But it's one of those logos that you just recognize when you see it. And you're not confused about what it is. Yeah, there uh, seems to be a trend of that in, in baseball, especially even like in Detroit. They've got the old English D. It's just iconic, right? It's... It is. Now, I know we talked about that a little extra. We got a few things before. We got to let you go because obviously time flies. You're having fun. But St. Louis, the Cardinals. They have a generational talent in Jordan Walker. Okay. I, I, I think that kid's special. You got Donovan, you got Tyler O'Neill, Canadian love. Uh, you got Wilson Contreras, who was playing catcher. Now he's left fielder. And again, this is older news. We're talking a little bit of older news, but we haven't had the chance to have an episode. So tough, tough luck for anyone who has who's heard this. You get to hear our opinion now. Do you? The Cardinals themselves are um, well under 500 right now, underachieving. Very passionate baseball community. Bush Stadium is always electric. Okay, does. And their manager is just so open about the, the, the changes that they're doing. It's an unusual tactic. So, Connor, what's your feedback? What do the Cardinals need to do to get back into gear? Because they're not – they should be a much better team than what they are. The, the record could arguably be they, sh they should be a first-place team in that division. Yeah, it, it is kind of odd seeing, like, where they're at versus, like, the tools that they kind of have in their, in their toolbox. At this point, the best thing about the Cardinals is their jersey color. Realistically, <laughs> like – I. Sorry, I, I, I don't uh, know if there's like a quick fix um, in this sort of situation. Oftentimes what sucks about such a long schedule um, is if you fall behind early, you end up just treading for, yeah. for months and months. months. And, and that can have a psychological toll on a team that doesn't necessarily um, like play into to, to an individual game, but but over the course of time can can wear on even the best of players when you you know feel like you're doing good and then you, you look up at the standings and there's still such a ways to go. So um, it's a it's a tough spot, but you know there's still a lot of runway left uh, for for things to end on a positive note. A lot of time left. People are thinking you got the right now at the time of us talking, they're 17 and 26, right? So they're they're still under the 50 game mark. But a stat that really points out to me is that they're seven and 14 at home. That they have such a very passionate home field, a fan base that gets behind them, but also gets on the other side of them when they're not doing good. But they're not the Yankees by any means. No offense, Yankee fans, but oh my goodness. When you when it when your team is bad in New York, they they, they tell you. They booed Aaron Judge last year, okay? Anything can happen in New York. Okay, but the, the Cardinals themselves just tell me that they were gonna be behind the Cincinnati Reds at this time. Get this behind the Nationals at this time. I would have told you, nah, you're crazy. Behind the athletics that's not a case. So I can say, oh, yep, that makes sense because the athletics are 10 and 35. But we already talked about the athletics. The Cardinals, can they change it? Yes. But I think a lot of their problems, the bullpen's not living up to the hype. The pitching hasn't been strong. 
It's been all around problem. They have a manager who obviously doesn't have control in that locker room and is putting players in every which way. Uh, maybe players aren't comfortable playing for him. I, I, I think if you want to write the ship, you need to make a change up. In baseball, you can do that. You can change a manager, make a trade, make a couple moves, a couple call-ups. You can start really changing the layout of that team quickly. And if you look at the standings right now, they, they are obviously a little bit significantly back of the Brewers, but it's not impossible. They're seven and a half games back. Okay, they, if a couple moves, win a couple, sweep one series, all of a sudden you're three games back now. And if the Brewers have a couple games where they struggle, you're back in it. So it's not too late. But like Connor said, you're treading when you get behind. Okay. Now the last couple things I want to get to is perfect. I think it's a perfect lead in, Connor. The Toronto Blue Jays. Uh, we t- I want to talk about them before we talk about the Tigers. I want to let I want to save your team for last. We always talk Tigers Jays. I'm going to go Jays, Tigers here, okay? I want to be fair. I want to give you the love to give a little bit of ground to the Tigers because I know game sports show fans, for a lot of different reasons, don't get to hear a lot about the Tigers anymore on our platform. So they get to hear it a lot from you, my friend. You're 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 the Tiger faithful, okay? So we got a lot of Michigan listeners that love when we talk Tigers, so I promise you, Michigan listeners, we're going to hit the Tigers. We'll give it most of the love, even more than the Jays. But what I want to say about the Jays is what really stands out to me on a statistic, and at this time while we're talking, the Jays are currently against the Yankees and they're scoreless in the bottom of the seventh. Now, that's not going to mean anything when you hear this, but I bring that up with value. And the reason why I do is because they are actually under 500 against teams in their own division. Okay, at home, they have a great record. On the road, they're just a game under 500 or so. But against against the Yankees, the Red Sox, the Rays, they have more losses than wins. Okay, and instead of speaking exact stats, I'm just going to tell you, it doesn't matter what that is. You need to have a winning record against teams in your division because especially the way the AL East is going, Connor, that's arguably the best division in baseball, the most competitive division in baseball. Next to, I guess I'd say the AL West is looking pretty solid uh, as well. And I guess it'd be silly to not give some love to the NL East because there's a lot of closeness. The NL West, I guess there's a lot of closeness. But if I had to pick a division in terms of the way uh, of the competitiveness right now and just equal ground, I have to say the AL East out of all the divisions. And you don't want to get behind. You want to win those games against your division so you can move up the ladder like look at the race they're hot right Connor it's it's hard to battle back and that's where with one thing with the Jays that really sticks out to me is that they are not playing against their own division properly and a lot of those games are because of the way the pitchers are pitching do you agree that the Jays pitching hasn't maybe lived up to the hype Manoa um, you know the there's been some starts obviously from him that's the command has been bad uh, you've had some of the guys at bad Kiermaier has been a pleasant surprise but it seems like they're letting some important games get away early they really have been and if there's any you know positivity that Blue Jays fans can glean is that there seems to be a tide turning in that uh, just the other day I was at the Rogers Center and got to see Chris Bassett oh, yeah. throw what? yeah <laughs> yeah I got to see him throw a complete game shutout, and that was the first complete game shutout the Jays have had since 2015. So uh, when you get somebody like that who, you know, was brought in here, uh, he's got a killer curveball, excellent spin, uh, and just having him log like a full game, sometimes that's the sort of thing that like, you know, okay, wakes everybody up. They want to, uh, you know, you see a teammate do that, and it's like, okay, well, like, let me get mine, so... Uh, yeah. Hopefully the, the pitching staff can kind of piggyback off of those sorts of starts and and really try to get things going in the right direction. There's been pleasant surprises too, right? Like Bo's being Bo. The guy's just, just gross. But Chapman, yeah. right? Like Chapman's living up to that extra hype. Like he's one of the best hitters in baseball right now. Where I see kind of the issue in this order is not defensively. Like defensively, the improvements. People have asked me because we haven't talked about it on the show yet. I love the Varsho trade. I saw Gabriel Moreno get his first hit actually at Comerica Park. I was there in person, and that was a cool moment because there's so much hype about Gabriel Moreno, right? And then he gets traded. Him and Guriel, fan favorite Guriel, gets traded to Arizona, and you bring in the D show, Dalton Var show. And Dalton is one of those guys who you have control over for a few years. He can play catcher. He can play the outfield. He can play all over the diamond. His defensive ability, that's what helps win you games. That's been the Jays' problem, right? That small ball not winning games. They've relied on Mount Crushmore back in 2015, 2016. If you don't know what Mount Crushmore is, 
comment below and I'm going to call you an idiot because just look at the roster and the home runs that they had. Okay, that's what Mount Crushmore is. Pitching in the bullpen have been a problem. Getting swans and they addressed it. I have to give credit to the Jays' management. They tried to make this team better. They did defensively and in the bullpen. There's still some pieces that need to be had. And I think second base is kind of a, a looming gap. The, the uh, Espinal hasn't been great. I know Whit Merrifield's there, but he, they kind of use him all over the diamond. You know, if they Espinal hasn't lived up the hype, Biggio... Uh, guys got potential, but I feel like if they need to address something, if they can still add a piece in the rotation or bullpen, that'd be great. But adding a second baseman to add a bit more of that small ball baseball in the lineup. And I'm not saying get this guy because you're not going to get him, but again, Ozzy Albies, that's like the perfect second baseman. I love Ozzy Albies. I, I think that if you can find and grow someone on a tree like that, that's what you want. But I feel like they can go after some guys to really improve this team. If they're going to improve this team, I think the second base position would be one, along with some more bullpen help. Uh, and Hunjin Ryu has thrown some pitches. Looks like the injured freak is going to be back. And uh, if I were him, I'd be throwing him right in the long reliever spot. I would just leave him there because uh, he's probably going to break his ankle or something when he comes back anyways. Um, that's all we'll talk about with the Jays here because we have to – Connor does have to get going, but I want to give him time to briefly talk about the Detroit Tigers. And this is the Game Sports Show podcast. Segment two is the strike zone segment. Connor and David here. Connor, I want to give you the floor to talk about whatever you want about the Tigers uh, you know, right now when we're talking about the Tigers, they are sitting in the middle of the division, a few games under 500. It's Miggy's last year. Obviously, there's a lot of memories with Miggy, but there's a lot of optimism to look forward to with that Tigers lineup, the young guys there. I like Thorkelson. I like Green. Um, obviously, Casey Mize hasn't really lived up to the full expectation at this current time, right? There's guys that are coming up, though, right? The Tigers are looking like, uh, it's just going to be exciting to watch. There's going to need to be some patience, but I want to give you the floor to talk about the Tigers for a few minutes. I, I think if there's one thing that I, I'd like to mention, it's uh, a story I'll tell. Um, a friend of mine is a diehard Tigers fan, uh, and he told me recently over this past weekend that, um, you know, that this season is actually looking like better than he thought, especially in, in light of uh, the injuries to Mize and Scooble. Um, and that it's exciting to kind of see these players who, uh, like I've never heard of before, just jumping into the, the lineup and finding ways to contribute, especially in terms of the pitching. I, I mean, if you quiz me to, to name like the eight or so seven or eight bullpen, uh, pitchers that the Tigers had entering into the season, like I'd fail that test. 10 times out of 10. Um, but the fact that they're managing to, you know, hover around 500 and they're starting to, to win some, some series recently, uh, there is some optimism despite the injuries that they've had. So I think that there is, is probably more positivity at this point in the season than there, than there has been at, at any point in the season. And, and that's something to smile about. Yeah, you know, you think it's drafting in baseball is so much different, right? Like than other sports, basketball, football, like, Football's even a shot in the dark. You drive someone in the fifth round and they're Tom Brady example, right? It doesn't matter what round you go. It just seems like hockey's the only sport. <laughs> well, no, I can't even say that. Zetterberg, that's – there's so many – like draft picks are always so hit and miss. But the Tigers have had some high picks. Mize, Green. I forget what Green went. But Mize Green went fifth. Green Mize was 1-1. One, one. One. Exactly, right? So Torkelson was 1-1. One, one. Exactly. So there's some top picks that you had. You're really – and you got to have patience, though. In baseball, it's not like generational talents take time. Mike Trout's a generational talent. I People think I'm crazy, but like the Ann Ortiz. Nobody knows who the Ann Ortiz is, or maybe you do. He's on YouTube. He does baseball, MLB The Show franchise. He can send me the bill uh, whenever I'm giving him some promotion here. He has some great stuff. He was actually talking about the Cardinals uh, and saying how he thought Jordan Walker was a generational talent. And I, I thought I was the only guy who thought Jordan Walker would potentially be a generational talent. The size, the power, just the hype, everything was there. Um, but it takes time for these young guys to develop in baseball. And if you bring them in too early, they're done. Their confidence is done. They, it's hard to bounce back from. You have some late bloomers. I think of Jose Bautista. That's a late bloomer. He was never considered generational talent. I want everyone to know that. Uh, but he was never a top prospect. It took time. He went through the the Pittsburgh Pirates organization, went through the Orioles. The Jays got him for neck to for basically free. And he comes into the Jays and he hits 54 home runs. Look, it just takes time for some players and the right coach to develop. And I think the Tigers have a good organization and the fans have to be patient. And our, and I, 
some people think that they're not patient from what I see on a lot of comments, social media comments, but I got to give credit to the Tigers fans. I was at Comerica Park. I was talking to some Lions, or Lions uh, Tigers faithfuls uh, and very passionate fans, and they were saying how they got to trust the process. Okay, and that's just the theme of Detroit right now. C.V. Eisenman in Detroit. Trust me, the Red Wings are going to be the best team in hockey in a couple years. Mark my words. They have the best GM at the helm. The Tigers are just looking great. The Lions, look, if any or if any city needs to know about patience, just be a Lions fan in Detroit. Look, it's 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 the Tigers have been that team in Detroit that I think have been pretty successful along with the Wings. I'm not including the Wings because they've won how many cups that they've won in the recent 20 years, but – they have a good system in Detroit, and I think you just need patience. And when Mize is back healthy, when Thorkerson starts swinging the bat the way he should, and then you start building a team around these guys, bringing in some guys, watch out. I think you agree? Or did I go too far? <laughs> no, I think you nailed it, man. I, I feel like I'm a Tiger fan right there. I feel like I give a lot I, of I, I want to conscript you to the Tigers faithful at this point. I, I think, you know, you've had enough love for the Jays. Now come join us on the dark side. Oh, the honestly, being a Toronto fan in general, as everyone heard in the first segment, is uh, it's a tough time. Uh, it's tough all around to be a Toronto fan. But, Connor, I kept you a couple minutes over time here. I appreciate you giving some love to the Tigers. Uh, one of my listeners at uh, the Strike Zone podcast will be returning as its own segment in the coming weeks. Uh, to be honest, uh, there's a lot of events coming in my personal schedule, so we probably will not have a Strike Zone upload until the beginning of June. Just so everybody knows, we'll do Strike Zone likely starting at the beginning of June and on a bi-weekly to every uh, – Eight, 14 to every 14 to 18 days kind of routine. Yes, I said 18 as an exact number, uh, just to get uploads up once or twice a month for all the listeners. Then, of course, when playoffs start, we get those routine uploads going for you. So, Connor, I want to say thank you for taking the time. This is your first time on the Game Sports Show podcast, like the headline show, so it's great to have you on and on video. This is your hour first video together, and it's in this moment. Like, I can't I, – I, I'm, I'm honored to be in your presence right now. No. Just, you know, I'm, I was nervous. Dave had sent in all these like hair and makeup people over and they've been, you know, doing me up all all evening. And I was I was sweating. I was like, what am I getting myself into here? But no, it's been really good to to get going on the video side of it. Oh, it'll be good when I start sending you some swag, uh, some swag to wear and some stuff and some uh, all the fun, uh, fun stuff we're going to have here on the game sports show. So uh, I'm guessing you won't be playing ball this summer, though, with us. No, <laughs> I am. I, I've. Sold my talents to Windsor, so yeah. So you got to bring it there. You got to bring the pandas to Windsor. I wouldn't. I wouldn't mind. Yeah, you guys want to do a home and home or what? <laughs> It'd be cool if you won a men's league title in Windsor, playing hardball with the pandas, and we win one here in the suit. That'd be something. We can start. Let's make it happen. I like that. So, Connor, thanks again. This has been the Strike Zone segment on the Game Sports Show podcast. We're going to be wrapping up the Game Sports Show podcast here in just a few seconds. I'm going to say bye to Connor one more time. Thanks again, Connor, for coming on. We'll be talking soon with uh, some baseball throughout the summer, my friend. Looking forward to it, Dave. Awesome. So as we get to the conclusion here, this is the worst part of the show, I call it, uh, because we're saying goodbye, but it's not goodbye forever because there will be another Game Sports Show episode, of course, and a lot of shows that are powered by the Game Entertainment Media or presented by the Game Sports Show, and the list goes on. Like I talked about at the beginning of the podcast, all the upcoming shows, make sure you keep an eye on all of that. Uh, as I mentioned, this has been the Game Sports Show podcast. I've been your host, David McCaig Jr. I've been joined by Connor Henderson. I want to say thank you to everyone in the Game Sports Show family. I want to say thank you to the producers in the background the Mike, the Sony's, the Alex Floods, uh, my fiance Hannah Marsh, who does all the thumbnails for the Game Sports Show. Yes, I'm throwing her under the bus here as well. Make sure you like, follow, and subscribe on all of the T Gem content as well as the Game Sports Show uh, content, as we will be obviously bringing you uploads at frequent. And if you are doing a podcast, don't hesitate to reach out to yours truly, and I'll get you connected with T Gem to get you on that channel. I know a guy, <laughs> uh, but nonetheless. I want to say thank you again to Connor and to everyone joining here on this episode. Like I said, make sure you hit like, follow, and subscribe to the Game Sports Show content. I'm here to wrap it up for you now just to let you know. And as a reminder, keep your stick on the ice, swing your bats, catch your touchdowns, drain your threes, and shoot your shots. Booyah. <laughs>